Hello there, lovely people. It's Alex from Nintendo Life here, and today I'm going to be giving you a brief history on a certain series which you should know if you read the title. Yes, today we're going to be looking at Animal Crossing, and I want to give a big sloppy wet shout out to one of my colleagues, Gavin Lane, who has uh, taken my words and made them a little bit more, uh, shall we say, suitably rounded, rather than the strange, constant, blathering runnings on that I usually do. But anyway, that's more than enough waffling. Let's dive dive right into things. Like most games made by Nintendo, the story of Animal Crossing, Nintendo's charming social life sim series, begins in Japan with a man named Katsuya Eguchi, and I'm terribly sorry with how I pronounced that. After he nabbed a job at Nintendo in 1986, he was forced to move away from his hometown of Chiba and relocate to Kyoto, the city where Nintendo was and still is based. Eguchi worked on several projects hither and thither, notably as a level designer for things like Super Mario Bros. 3, but the move to Kyoto stuck with him even after after he had settled in, and it was a primary influence upon the creation of Animal Crossing. Higuchi elaborated on the main themes of the original game in an interview with Edge magazine. Animal Crossing features three themes, family, friendship, and community. But the reason I wanted to investigate them was a result of being so lonely when I arrived in Kyoto. When I moved there, I left my family and friends behind. In doing so, I realized that being close to them, being able to spend time with them, talk to them, play with them, was such a great, important thing. I wondered for a long time if there would be a way to recreate that feeling, and that was the impetus behind the original Animal Crossing. Joining forces with the ever-excellent Takashi Tezuka, Eguchi he began the series with Dobutsu no Mori, again apologies for any pronunciations like that, a Japan exclusive game for the N64 which roughly translates to Animal Forest in English. The game was originally planned to be released for the 64DD, an add-on which sat under the N64 and took advantage of rewritable whizzy spinny discs that could hold a lot more data than a simple cartridge. Unfortunately, the expansion was a commercial disaster, and after countless delays and other problems, Nintendo just decided to slap it on a cartridge instead. There was an issue with this, however, as the game relies heavily on a real-time clock which the 64DD offered, but the N64 base unit lacked. Therefore, Nintendo did the only sensible thing and stuck a clock inside the game cartridge, because why not? Whilst it worked for the most part, relying on such a solution meant that should the battery run dry, there'd be no way to get the game to track the time when you weren't playing, which is a significant issue given that this was one of the biggest features. This initial release on N64 launched in Japan on the 14th of April 2001, but it wasn't long until a new, shiny and improved version called Dobutsu no Mori Plus released for GameCube in December of the same year. The fact that the GameCube actually had a blooming clock in it made fabricating discs easier and cheaper than producing more cartridges for the aging, older Nintendo 64, even if the upgraded game still looked very much like an N64 title. Oh, those polygons. The GameCube version also came with a selection of new stuff as well, much of which has remained throughout the entire series, including Tortimer, Cap'n, the Able Sisters, and the museum. Can you believe the museum wasn't in the original game? That's bunkers. Suffice it to say, if you bought the N64 original and then saw this version less than nine months later, you'd probably be feeling a bit miffed. Still, it's hard to be angry when you're playing Animal Crossing. The success of the game caught the interest of some other Nintendo employees outside of Japan, and despite the mountains of dialogue and text that had to be localized, Nintendo of America set about making what most of you watching will recognize as Animal Crossing for the GameCube, with its classic tagline, Population Growing, that still gets ignored to this day. Not only did they translate everything, but they also decided to add in other things such as new holidays. The original game was very Japan-centric when it came to annual festivals, but adding in things like Toy Day, Christmas, and Halloween Halloween helped to make the game more recognizable and relatable to a Western audience. Animal Crossing launched in North America less than a year following its Japanese counterpart on the 16th of September 2002, although Europeans like me had to wait a further two years to get our first taste of animal forest life. The game was well received, but more interestingly, the Japanese portion of Nintendo was so impressed with Nintendo of America's additions that they decided to take all that new content from the Western release plus a little bit extra and release yet 
another version of the game called Dobutsu no Mori E+, a whole year before Europe even got the first game. The game was even released on the IQ player in China in 2006. Perhaps as Europeans should count ourselves lucky that we didn't have to wait until after that came out. The game was a hit, and dominance over the dead simulator genre had been established, so it was time for a proper sequel. Even though the game had started small and local, Animal Crossing's success was global, so when the time came to make a sequel, Iguchi made sure to change things around for as broad a demographic as possible. Everything from fish, bugs, fossils, holidays were redesigned with an international multicultural market in mind. The platform choice was a bold move as well, as even though the GameCube had sold a respectable number of units, this new game would be shrunk down onto the tiny Nintendo DS instead. Despite its size, the DS packed quite a Punch features-wise, including built-in features that the GameCube just didn't possess, like a microphone that you could use to scream at other villagers to find out where they were. Parents loved that! Animal Crossing Wild World also had the major advantage of not having to rely on being plugged into the wall at all times, meaning you could take your village with you wherever you went. The DS also technically had Wi-Fi capabilities, so you could visit other people's villages locally or non-locally using the patented friend code system and even send them charming or more likely rude messages. The game was a smash hit, and thanks to the overwhelming success of the DS in all of its third pillar glory, superseded the original release financially and critically, taking the winning formula and improving upon almost every single aspect in a handy portable package was a flat out no brainer to consumers, and the series relaxing gameplay appealed to the same broad demographic of players attracted to the Nintendo DS by games like Brain Training and Nintendogs, players who might never have sat down to play something on GameCube, but were more than willing to try something new on the DS. There were a few issues, however. With the introduction of the new whiz-bang internet, Nintendo had the ability to distribute letters containing gifts to people fancy enough to have a connection, and so they did. One gift called Red Tulips came with a blank letter, and after placing the mysterious object in your home, not only would it be invisible, but the game still thought there was something there, so you couldn't move through it. What's worse is whatever was there couldn't be touched or moved either, so you weren't able to pick it back up, meaning you now just had a big invisible blockade in your home. It was, it was great. Nintendo's response was swift and its solution to the problem simple. Don't open the letter and just throw the item away, it's genius. Wild World was a marvel back in the day, a handheld duel that married the charm of the series with the convenience of portability. Then it was released on the Wii U Virtual Console. But the original sucked hundreds of wonderful hours away from us. Portable play is all well and good, but what if you had a real hankering for that classic big screen experience on your 12-inch CRT with only one working speaker? With the 2006 launch of the Wii came a two-year wait before the series returned to home consoles with Animal Crossing Let's Go to the City, or at least that's what it was called in Europe. In North America, it went by Animal Crossing City Folk because Nintendo of America refused to publish any game with more than five words in the title. Although, to be honest, we could do with a bit of that these days with things like Cadence of Hyrule, Crypt of the Necrodancer featuring The Legend of if the name didn't give it away at all, Let's Go to the City allows you to venture outside the peaceful tranquility of your town and yes, <laughs> go to a city. That was about the only major difference between this and Wild World though, and the game was criticised for being far too similar to its predecessor. Part of that may be because it's based on exactly the same engine as the DS version. I mean, you could have more villagers, your own home rather than sharing one with anyone else who had a character in the game, but much of City Folk was subject to only very minor changes. One area touted as an improvement over Wild World was the We Speak peripheral released alongside this new game. This was essentially a big microphone that you could place near your TV and talk to people as though they were in the same room with you. I paid money for this. In reality, it was a largely disappointing low quality microphone that forced you to shout at your TV rather than just whisper delicately into a headset. Not that people don't shout into headsets. The Wii Speak only ever supported 13 games, and it's not hard to see why. But what about the headlining trip to the city? That's surely got to be something special, right? Well, you could buy clothes, change your hairstyle, or fashion yourself a me mask, talk to special characters. The city area basically just freed up your town to be more focused on your villagers rather than cluttering it all up with shops. As an idea, it works well enough, but it also feels strangely disconnected to your actual town, and left it feeling somewhat empty at times. Consequently, Animal Crossing Let's 
Let's Go to the City ends up being one of the lesser games in the series, as it really didn't push any boundaries beyond what had already been done before. That's not to say Nintendo didn't put work into the Wii entry. According to the Games Iwata Asks interview, it features the equivalent of over 4,000 pages of text. But in a series of slow and steady iteration, City Folk was the slowest and steadiest of Animal Crossings. If it was your only Animal Crossing game at the time, you probably would have been more than happy with what you had, but it wouldn't be long before you could start all over again. Whether or not Let's Go to the City's lukewarm reception was a reason or not, the next game in the series returned to a handheld, specifically the Nintendo 3DS. Animal Crossing New Leaf took even more inspiration from around the world and squeezed it all into a diminutive cartridge once again. The 3D display of the console meant the designers had to take extra care making sure the new perspectives didn't reveal any behind-the-scenes graphical goodness, but apart from that, development went fairly smoothly. The game launched in 2012 in Japan and the following year everywhere else, due to yet another Another monumental localization job. This time around, you're not just some schmuck selling seashells and fallen fruit in an already flooded market, <laughs> oh crumbs no! Instead, upon arriving in your new town, you're greeted as the new mayor of this rural backwater, with the power to mould and shape the town and even its inhabitants according to your most sordid whims. Being the mayor means you have the ability to change more of the town than ever before, and even dictate people's bedtimes to suit your own unhealthy schedule. Despite this being such an integral part of what made New Leaf New Leaf, this idea was only decided on a year after the game had actually started development. And with Tortima booted from office, the next chapter of Animal Crossing had its own unique selling point. The game was very well received, and in 2016, a full three years after its initial release, an updated version called Animal Crossing New Leaf Welcome Amiibo landed on store shelves. As the new title suggested, this is a revised version of the game that boasted new Amiibo functionality and extra modes including an expanded campsite, but those with the base game were able to simply update their original copy to include all the new features for free thanks to the mysterious magic of the internet. Shortly before this updated version released though, we saw the very first spin-off for the series. A recurring part of Animal Crossing is the ability to have your home evaluated and judged by a panel of so-called experts known only as the Happy Home Academy. If your home meets their arbitrary requirements, then bang, you got a good number appear in a letter in your postbox, hooray. Expanding the lore of this shadowy, spectre-like organization to its own game, Animal Crossing Happy Home Designer was born. This 3DS spin-off behaved entirely different to the main games, and instead of tending to a town in real time, you were instead tasked with designing and building Wait for it. Happy homes. And classrooms and other things. Basically, if it was any type of room, you could run up and design the hell out of it according to your client's requirements. Speaking of requirements, yeah, you've got to fulfill your client's specifications and wishes, but at the same time, you can almost entirely ignore them and they'll still love it. The game really wasn't terribly strict with you and instead allowed you to get away with doing as much or as little as you wanted. And better yet, it didn't even have to make any real sense. Unsurprisingly, this laid back attitude meant that some players felt that the game didn't really have any significant challenge, but I still enjoyed it personally, and collecting the associated amiibo cards and amiibo became a bit of a slight obsession whenever they were cheap. Okay, not obsession's the wrong word. However, the game did introduce undeniable improvements when it came to the object management in and around your humble abode. You could design gardens, move objects in half grids, and there was a lot more in terms of item variation and styles. Thankfully, new leafers didn't have to wait until the next series entry to enjoy these features in the main games. They were included in the Welcome Amiibo update, and very welcome they were too. Animal Crossing Happy Home Designer released in the latter half of 2015 to a big old mixed response response from fans and critics, although it wasn't the only Animal Crossing spin-off we got that year. Around the same time as Happy Home Designer, there was another Animal Crossing project brewing, one that had single-handedly dragged Nintendo's 2015 E3 showcase down from pretty meh to... Why would you do this to us? Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival, the first high-definition game in the series, is a party game. A party game that uses Amiibo to the point that you actively have to own Amiibo in order to play the game, no exceptions. You'd tap your Amiibo on the gamepad, you'd move a randomly selected number of spaces, and then something either good, bad, or more likely uninspiring would happen. You'd lose or gain bells or happiness, and the person with the highest total at the end 
wins. You do admittedly get these charming little mini cutscenes whenever you land on a space, and it's really quite pleasing the first three times you see it, but it's not long before you realise that this is everything the game has to offer. The game was heavily criticised for being mindless, uninteresting, and no more than a vehicle to sell amiibo which can now be bought for an absolute pittance. At least that was the case until New Horizons was announced. The game was almost universally panned, and there honestly isn't a lot else to say about it. It's just something that most fans would rather forget. The only silver lining here is that it meant that the Animal Crossing amiibo line actually got made, and for that we can't help but be a little bit thankful, we think. And even that wasn't the end of the spin-off train either, <laughs> oh no. In late 2017, Nintendo released the free-to-play Animal Crossing Pocket Camp for Android and iOS smart devices, and everybody immediately lost their minds fearing that this was the direction the series was going to take forever. Pocket Camp was, and still is, a strange beast, taking notes from the main series but stripping most of the game back to a simpler form. Likely because you, well, for one thing, don't have a controller to guide your character around, only your filthy, filthy fingers. This is also the first and currently only game in the series to include the option of in-game purchases, or... <laughs> That's right, you can spend your hard-earned real-life currency if you so wish, or you could be a chump and be patient like me. The response to this vastly different way to play was met with some criticism, but constant updates and the introduction of new things to do have resulted in a game that most people rate as being just about fine. For our money, it's simple enough to not engage with the systems in the game that you don't like, and as a free game, there's quite a bit to like about Pocket Camp, although it's nothing like the full fat experience fans have been clamouring for since the Switch was launched back in 2017. Happy Home Designer, Amiibo Festival, and Pocket Camp were merely stepping stones to a broader, newer horizon. Animal Crossing characters have appeared in a variety of other places as well, most notably the Super Smash Bros and Mario Kart series, and from humble, local beginnings the series has blossomed. Its importance in Nintendo's library these days cannot be understated, and its popularity continues to soar. The recently released Animal Crossing New Horizons on the Nintendo Switch is evidence enough for that. The game was announced in 2018 with a tentative 2019 release date, but as you probably know, that didn't happen. It got delayed until 2020, and, well, it's out now and it's bloody lovely. But my great goggly goodness, the amount of hype building up to this game and the amount of people scrabbling around for any small fraction of a detail that might be new was unprecedented and is the kind of thing usually reserved for things like Mario and Zelda, but here we are with it in Animal Crossing. After years of diligent work, Animal Crossing has quietly become one of Nintendo's biggest franchises. An evergreen money spinder and a joyful series that brings people together like few are able to do. That's not at all bad for a game born out of loneliness. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, then why don't you broaden your horizons to include that subscribe button, and be sure to check out NintendoLife.com for all sorts of lovely Nintendo-related content. Thank you again for watching. Bye-bye.